During the COVID-19 pandemic, variants of the virus have continuously emerged, and some of them have been labeled as variants of concern. For example, we've all heard of the Alpha, Delta, and Omicron variants. If a new variant was to emerge, can we tell if it will lead to a large wave of infections and hospitalizations? On which features would allow the new variant to have a transmission advantage or to evade vaccines and prior infection immunity? We will discuss these questions and more in today's episode. This is Svider Presents, a series produced by the Svider Podcast Hub. My name is Laura Guzman. And mine is Ed Hill. In today's episode, we'll talk to Dr. Louise Dyson, Associate Professor in Epidemiology at the University of Warwick. We'll talk about her recent work on the emergence of COVID variants of concern and in which scenarios they could generate large waves of infections and hospitalizations. Louise is a participant in SPIMO, the Scientific Pandemic Influenza Group on Modeling, Operational Subgroup of SAGE, the Scientific Advisory Group for Emergencies. SPIMO has provided advice based on infectious disease modeling and epidemiology to the UK government in response to the COVID-19 pandemic. Today she will be telling us about the research article, possible future ways of SARS-CoV-2 infection generated by variants of concern with a range of characteristics. This was published in Nature Communications in September 2021, done in collaboration with colleagues at the University of Manchester, and they're also part of the Juniper Consortium, the Joint University's Pandemic and Epidemiological Research Group. This is a modeling consortium formed in the autumn of 2020 to provide quantitative epidemiological advice in response to the evolving pandemic. Hi, Louise. Thanks for joining us today. Oh, thanks for having me. Would you like to first tell us about the kind of the context when Nish started thinking about this piece of work and what the situation was at the time? Yes, yes. So I guess a bit of background. Uh, we started thinking about these sorts of problems in March 2021. Uh, so we'd just seen the rise of alpha in the UK, sort of Christmas 2020. And that was the first variant that had had an actual major effect on overall cases. It's kind of weird thinking back to that now, um, having had so many more variants since then. But at that time, it was, we were really kind of thinking about, will there be another variant that's going to be that impactful again? Or was, was that it? And Alpha had had a kind of higher transmissibility but no major changes to immunity, either through vaccinations or through prior infection. And at that point, uh, we were thinking with uh, SPIM about whether the beta variant, which had become dominant in South Africa and had some immune escape compared to the previous alpha variant. Um, and we were thinking about whether that was going to be a major issue in the UK or not. And we were also thinking in the kind of context of uh, we had just started these kind of stepwise relaxations, the kind of UK roadmap to relaxations. Um, and so that kind of inspired this paper where we were thinking about the potential for new variants and what they might look like in the data in this kind of context. So what were the specific aims of this study? Uh, yeah, so we were thinking about sort of three main questions. So uh, what kind of new variants might be a problem? And what would they look like in the data? So could we use the data kind of to tell them apart? Um, and how quickly might we need a kind of new targeted vaccine? So if we had a new vaccine that was targeted against a specific variant, how quickly would we need that to be um, sort of rolled out in order to be worth implementing any kind of border controls? With this kind of situation at the time, there's a, a multifaceted problem. There's lots of there's different approaches that could be taken to analyze it. So what was the kind of methodologies that were used and in terms of like the overall team as well? How did the collaborative team come together for this study? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, it's become much easier to collaborate between different places that are geographically distinct. I mean, Manchester is not a huge distance from, from Warwick, but um, uh, during the pandemic, we've been working with uh, lots of people in lots of different UK institutions. And the kind of umbrella organisation for that has been um, Juniper, which is a kind of the COVID-19 modelling consortium. And 
that's really kind of brought together lots and lots of different UK institutions, including Warwick and Manchester, which were the, the primary groups for, for this particular paper. And it's made it sort of possible for us to all work together in, in this kind of large group, which has been really nice and really um, exciting, and I hope will continue for, for a long time in the future. So we had multiple groups of people kind of coming together to form this paper. There were sort of three main kind of modeling approaches. First was, well, we call it a simple model. It's really not that simple, but uh, <laughs> simpler than it could have been. Um, and that was really just thinking about if we had uh, different uh, variants circulating at the same time, how those would interact with each other in the same population. Um, and then we had uh, the more complicated Warwick model, which has been used throughout the pandemic, um, particularly in kind of questions from SPIM. Um, and the advantage there is that that model can output hospitalizations and deaths, which the simple model couldn't. And it's also age distributed. So you could look at the age distributions in the data. And then the third part, which was um, primarily... Uh, a group in Manchester developing that model. So that was thinking about new cases coming into the UK from outside. So thinking about this kind of border controls question. And uh, so that was a stochastic model. So we were looking at kind of how quickly a new variant might become established in the UK. And um, what did you find from these models? Yeah, so because we used lots of different models, we found lots of different things, which is uh, always interesting. <laughs> The main initial part that was using this kind of simple model, the advantage there is that you can look at lots and lots of different uh, situations. So we were thinking about variants um, being different along two main axes. So first is transmissibility, uh, and the second is immune escape. Maybe the vaccination or prior infection might give you less protection against future infection. Uh, the situation we were thinking of was quite specific in a way. Because we were kind of doing this relaxation, we were doing these kind of stepwise relaxation of restrictions. And uh, simultaneously, we're vaccinating more people. So the relative importance of, our, of those two effects to control is changing over time. So early on, when the control is more about measures and less about uh, vaccination-derived immunity a kind of more transmissible variant is worse compared to a kind of vaccine escape variant. And later on, uh, it's sort of the two things are reversed. Um, so in particular, you could have a variant that was less transmissible than the kind of resident variant, but had immune escape. And that can kind of lurk in the background until those sort of final relaxation of measures and then come out. That's sort of what we were thinking about with this kind of beta variant, where you might have something that the immune escape is really important. So that's sort of the, the first finding. And then the more complex full Warwick model shows us, uh, of course, that the outcome of these waves of infections will depend a bit on the effect of vaccination on hospitalization. So if you still have lots of immunity against hospitalization, then you you know, a wave of infection is still important, but it's less uh, impactful than if you also have uh, less uh, protection against hospitalization. And that model is also interesting because we were vaccinating people in this kind of age-structured way. Uh, you can see in the, the simulated data that immune escape variants end up with this kind of different age distribution of cases than variants that only have effect on transmissibility. So that gives us a potential way that we can see in the data uh, if a variant has immune escape or not. And then finally, uh, using this kind of stochastic models of, of importations in, into the country, we can see that the timings are really kind of finely balanced. So uh, whether it's worth imposing border controls really depends on whether you can make and distribute a newly targeted vaccine before the wave happens. So in practice, it's probably only really worth employing border controls if you have some kind of specific goal in mind, because it's just slowing things down. So unless you're really going to completely close your borders, 
there's only really a point to having some kind of border controls if you have a plan for what you're going to do with that extra time. So I'd say it's fascinating to see taking the different modeling approaches, then the specific insights that each one could essentially tease apart and basically help inform our understanding about the situation. Given that, were there particular implications of these findings or a specific finding from the models, which very helpful at the, at the time, and then as kind of the Delta variant and then Omicron have subsequently emerged, helped inform our understanding as the those variants arose? Yeah, yeah. So... Um... I guess the some of the modeling was quite specific to the time in that, you know, this kind of age structured effect was really because we were doing vaccinations in that way. And these kind of stepwise relaxations, you know, we we then did and we're kind of done with now. But uh, particularly this idea that you could look at the kind of age distribution of cases and age distribution of hospitalizations, um, I think, uh, was really uh, interesting and was used when the Delta and Omicron waves came later on. And particularly, um, I guess we were thinking in this age distributed way. Um, and so then other researchers got the idea to kind of look at the age distribution of cases, thinking not so much about the difference between the different kinds of variants, but instead thinking about whether a new variant had kind of reached the full population. So when when Delta comes in, it kind of comes into a population that are essentially people who are kind of traveling a lot. And to start with, you see growth in that population. But uh, what you really want to know is, has it kind of reached the medium term growth that you're expecting to see? Or are you still in that very specific population? So then you're kind of comparing the age distribution of the new variant with the age distribution of the old variant. So that wasn't something that our paper was particularly expecting to happen, but I think it was something that was sort of inspired by thinking about these kind of distributions. It is great to see how this study has shaped the way you have addressed questions afterwards. So what's next? And in your view, what is important to consider regarding COVID variants in the future? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's um, things have changed a lot since we wrote this paper. It's, it's <laughs> it wasn't all that long ago, so it's sort of slightly surprising to, to think about only really a year ago that we were thinking about these things and uh, the world has changed a lot since then. Um, I think the big question right now is, uh, for the UK particularly, is because we're um, really reducing the amount of data that we're collecting, there's this big question for public health. How can we still uh, see these sorts of things coming? Can we? Do we know when there might be a new variant around? If there is, what are we going to do about it? And what kind of data can we use to look at that? And are we still collecting the right kind of data to be able to, to follow these sorts of problems? And I'm not sure that I have an answer to that question, but I think it's an interesting question. <laughs> Thank you very much for joining us, Louise, today. It's been great speaking with you. Thank you for having me. It's, it's always nice to, to talk about the research that you've done. Yeah, I'm hoping to have you back with more future research. I, I would be happy to do that. This is our news section, where in each episode we will give updates on events happening in the research group. In today's episode, we're going to talk about RAMP, short for Rapid Assistance in Modelling, the Pandemic Initiative. RAMP are hosting a conference on the Monday of 30th of June titled Modelling the COVID-19 Pandemic, Achievements and Lessons. And this is an event several members of Spider will be attending. We are here with our colleagues from Spider, Robin Thompson. He's an assistant professor at the University of Warwick, and he's a member of RAMP. Thanks for joining us today, Robin. Hi there, Lara. Hi, Ed. Good to be here. Thanks for the invitation. And thanks for coming. Cheers for joining us. To begin, uh, so what is RAMP? Uh, that's a good question. Good place to start. Um, so RAMP is the Rapid Assistance in Modelling the Pandemic Initiative. Um, and it's a team of mathematical scientists led by Professor Mike Cates from the University of Cambridge that was brought together by the Royal Society in 2020 in order to support the UK's COVID-19 modelling response. And RAMP is funded by UKRI. And what initiatives has RAMP carried out? 
So Ramp's done a number of different things during the pandemic, but I think it's supported the UK's COVID-19 modeling response in two kind of main ways. The first way um, that we've done that is through assessing the COVID-19 modeling literature, and I'll come back to that in a second. And then the second way is through the development of our own models and modeling insights that are useful for guiding public health policy. So in terms of assessing the modeling literature, I was involved in, in that through setting up the RAMP Rapid Review Group, along with professors Philip Meany and Alan Gorielli from Oxford. And the idea of the Rapid Review Group is that UK government departments and also uh, UK government advisory groups would get in touch with us when they saw a mathematical modeling analysis that they thought might be useful for policy. And so they send it across to us. And what we would do is we would review that modeling analysis um, to assess its sort of relevance for policy and to assess its quality. And obviously in a public health emergency, you have to do that very, very quickly. And so we had a team of expert reviewers that would return reviews to us within only sort of 24 to 48 hours so that it could then feed into policy making. So that, that's one of the kind of main ways that we've been looking to support the UK's COVID-19 response. The other way is through the development of models and, and generation of modelling insights that are useful for policy. And we've done that not so much through sort of standard epidemiological modelling, but, but kind of looking more broadly at research areas like environmental and aerosol transmission, like urban analytics and like uh, transmission in, in small spaces. So that's a few of the areas that, that we've been looking at. And then in addition, um, we've had a number of other initiatives, um, one of which, of course, was the, the RAMP Outreach Innovation Awards. Um, so I think we awarded something like 10 uh, sort of small grants um, for projects around the country, one of which, of course, was this podcast. So, yeah, great to see that coming to fruition. And yeah, very appreciative of the support offered. And so kind of under the RAMP umbrella, the RAMP initiatives, is there any particular research that you've been able to conduct We've done a few different things. One project that I'm working on at the moment through RAMP that I'm really excited about is that RAMP is funding a postdoc, uh, Will Hart, who is working with me on estimating the COVID-19 generation time. So specifically the generation time is the time between successive transmissions uh, in a transmission chain. So as an example, if I were to infect you, which hopefully I won't, but if I was gonna infect you, um, then the generation time is the time between me getting infected and then me then infecting you. So it tells you about the speed of transmission of a virus or of a pathogen. And so what Will has been doing is he's been um, using data provided by the UK Health Security Agency describing transmission in households in the UK. And he's been using that data to then estimate the, what, what the generation time is for COVID-19. He's been looking at how the generation time has changed throughout the pandemic and then looking to attribute those changes to different factors. So for example, looking at how the generation time changed when different variants of SARS-CoV-2 came along. So yeah, so that's one project that, that's ongoing, funded by RAMP that I'm really excited about at the moment. Is there a place we can find all this research? Yeah, so well, talking specifically about, about that research project, um, it's been published in a couple of different um, publications. So one of them was published in eLife last year, and that was looking at how the generation time changed in 2020. And then subsequently, there was a, a paper um, published in the Lancet Infectious Diseases, looking at measuring the generation time for the uh, alpha and delta variants. And so comparing the generation time for those two different SARS-CoV-2 variants. Um, so the first author on, on those is my uh, student, now postdoc, William Hart. So I think looking at the two papers by, by him about the SARS-CoV-2 generation time is probably the place to look for that specific work. And I guess, I guess similarly for other RAMP funded research, I guess uh, looking for RAMP members and, and looking at publications that they've written would be probably the way to find out more about some of RAMP's research. Thanks, that's really good. And there is an event on Monday, the 13th of June. What is this event about? Yeah, so, th so that's coming up quite soon. So that's um, being held at the Royal Society in London. Um, and it's a workshop called uh, Modelling the COVID-19 Pandemic Achievements and Lessons. And so this workshop is split into two different sections. So the first one is a sort of daytime section. So that's from, I think, 9.30 in the morning until about 7 p.m. And that daytime session is aimed at scientists 
And the goal of that is that there'll be sort of scientific talks by early career researchers. I think there's going to be a panel discussion with various sort of eminent scientists about lessons learned from the COVID-19 pandemic. So that's during the day. And then in the evening, it's going to switch into some sort of public facing talks. I think the plan at the moment is to have three public lectures about COVID-19 modelling. I think that's between 7.30pm and 9.30pm. And so I'd urge anyone listening to definitely come along to that that second part. And if you're a scientist, then also come along to the daytime session too. But the one thing to bear in mind is that rather than just turning up, you have to register in advance. So I would suggest that you Google, uh, you know, the Royal Society Ramp 13th of June event, and it should be, I would hope, the top hit. Um, and then you just register on the website before before showing up. But yeah, so, so in the daytime, there's a scientific kind of session. And then in the evening, there's a sort of public facing set of talks. We're one of the participants in that public facing session, later on being our own group member, Louise Dyson, who we heard from earlier in this episode. Very good. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Very pleased that you could join us today, Robin. Thanks very much. Thanks for the invitation. Yeah, it was great to chat to you both. Thank you. Thanks to you all for listening to this episode of Spider Presents.